Chapter Three. The cog isn't a soul-crushing machine, dumbass. It's society, mutual support, mutual dependence. Individuality might sound all noble and free, but it generally means crapping on your neighbors. And if you crap on your neighbors, don't expect them to help you. Rules hold humans together, and it's together or die. Private Dom Santiago, explaining to a former stranded why he should stop whining about being drafted as part of Operation Lifeboat. Twenty-six years earlier, Olafson Intermediate School, Ephira, twelve B.E. He was a rich kid. He was different. And he was new. Carlos Santiago felt really, really sorry for Marcus Phoenix. He took refuge at a desk without looking around, as if not meeting anyone's eye would stop him from ever being noticed. He didn't look rich, no fancy clothes, just a school uniform like everybody else. But everyone knew who his dad was, and where he lived. He was also tall and skinny, very pale, with spooky light blue eyes that didn't go with his black hair. He might as well have stuck a target round along his back. The math teacher, Major Fuller, was as old-fashioned as the school building and ran classes as if he was still in the army. He even had one of those short brass-topped sticks, like the sergeants who drilled gears for parades. Every man in the Santiago family had served in the military, so Carlos knew all about that kind of thing. But the army was everywhere, part of life itself, and especially at school. This, Carlos's dad said, was where the military ethos made a man of you. Carlos had to look up the word. Introduce yourself, boy. Fuller said. Marcus stood up at his desk and didn't look around. Marcus Phoenix, sir. Age, parents, siblings. I'm ten years old. My parents are Professor Adam Phoenix and Doctor Elaine Phoenix. I'm an only child. Oh, Phoenix was dead for sure. Carlos's heart sank a little further. Marcus didn't even talk like the rest of them. He had a posh accent. He was going to get creamed. Fuller looked as if he was waiting for Marcus to go on, but there was a tense, empty silence, and Fuller gave up. Class, you will make him feel part of the team," he said stiffly in his major's voice. "And you will treat him with courtesy. You will not behave like street ruffians. You will behave like citizens. Are we clear?" The response was a mumbling chorus. Yes, Major Fuller. Joshua Curzon raised his hand. Sir, if he's rich, why is he here? You think this is a poor school? Well, we are all poor. Fuller brought his stick down on the lectern with a crack like rifle fire. Phoenix is here because society is formed from people pulling together, not breaking away into separate groups. Unity, because no man can exist on his own, no country either. That's why we have the coalition of ordered governments. Fuller repeated this speech so often that Carlos could recite it, and maybe that was the point. It made perfect sense when he stopped to think about it. If you look after your neighbor, your neighbor will look after you. Previous generations left a rich world for you. And you leave a rich world for those to come. Nobody who stands on the sidelines and thinks only of his needs can ever be a man. Yeah, that made sense too. But Carlos understood all that, so he was more interested now in finding out how much Marcus had, and how big his room was. He probably had a whole wing of the mansion to himself. The Phoenix estate was huge. Carlos had run around the perimeter once with Dom, thinking of shinning over the walls and seeing what the gardens were like, but he never dared. Getting Dom into trouble would make Mom go crazy. 
He was supposed to look out for his little brother and set a good example. This state looked like a prison, anyway. Open your books, Fuller said. Curzon, seeing as you're so interested in financial statistics, you can tell us what you learned yesterday about calculating averages. Carlos counted down the hours until lunch recess, watching dust motes circling in the shafts of sunlight from windows set high in the wood-paneled walls. The room smelled of permanence and wax polish. This building was hundreds of years old, and it would be here for hundreds more. War or no war. His grandfather could remember when the pendulum wars began, but Carlos couldn't. All in all, war didn't seem as bad as people said. Life went on. Besides, the real war was here, in Olafson Intermediate. At lunch, Carlos kept an eye on Marcus, just in case. Nobody sat next to him in the long refectory table. They just watched him. He never said a word. Eventually, Carlos couldn't stand it any longer picked up his plate, and moved to sit beside him. I'm Carlos Santiago, he said. What's behind the wall around your house? The wall on All Father's Avenue? Orchard, Marcus said, not meeting his eyes. Cool, Carlos nodded approvingly. Where did you go to school before? Private tutor. That explained a lot. This place isn't so bad. Hey, I saw your dad on the news once. He's famous. A scientist. Marcus turned and looked at Carlos. He always says he's an engineer, and my mother's the scientist. He used to be a gear. My dad was a gear. So was my granddad, and my uncles, and Aunt Rosa. I'll be one too. You decided already? It's great. Like a family, really. Marcus appeared to chew that over for a while. Maybe the cog officers like his dad. He'd have been an officer, not an ordinary gear. Didn't see it that way. Carlos stuck with Marcus through lunch, reluctant to give the others a chance to torment him. It would happen, but it would be over fast one way or another. Carlos had a feeling Marcus was going to have a harder time of it than anyone else. He wasn't very chatty. Carlos wondered if Marcus just didn't like him, but it seemed more like he didn't know what to do or say. Joshua Curzon and his brother Roland, a year older, shoved into Carlos's path as they filed into the main building. So he thinks he's too good for us. That could have meant Carlos, or Marcus, or both. Carlos knew he could handle himself in a fight, so he decided to set Joshua straight from the start. He found himself pitching in to defend Marcus immediately, just as he did for Dom. He's okay. Leave him alone. You're sucking up to him because he is rich. Joshua sneered. Snob. You're an ass-kissing snob, Santiago. And you're a moron. Leave him alone. Carlos had thrown down the gauntlet. Joshua accepted the challenge. Take that back. Shove it. Yeah? Yeah. Carlos pushed past him, but it wasn't over yet. He knew that. The last hour of the afternoon was usually spent playing trash ball. Carlos suspected it was because the teaching staff wanted to take it easy before they clocked off. But it was also handy for settling any arguments that cropped up during the day. Carlos made sure Marcus was on his team to avoid leaving him waiting to be picked. Joshua fixed Carlos with that, you're dead, stare. It didn't take long before Joshua made a lunge for the ball in the penalty area and brought his elbow down hard into Carlos's back. Carlos waited for the games master line of sight to be interrupted and brought his boot down hard on Joshua's instep, 
forcing a howl out of him. Yeah, that hurts, doesn't it? Stop whining, Curzon. The games master waved play on. Maybe he thought it was all part of toughening them up anyway. Or I'll transfer you to the girls' class. Marcus moved in to cover Carlos. He didn't look the athletic type, but he was tall, and he intercepted a pass easily. It seemed to surprise him that he'd caught it. He paused for a second. Joshua tackled him with a lot more force than needed, and Marcus fell headlong. He jumped to his feet, looking more embarrassed than hurt, but Carlos was not going to let that go. Carlos caught up to Joshua as they left the field, out of sight of the games master. I said, leave him alone. Oh, I forgot, you're his best friend. It's his first day, give him a break. It should have ended there. But it wasn't, of course. Marcus sat down next to Carlos on the changing room bench. They were the last two there. Don't worry about me, Marcus said. I'll be okay. But it's not fair, Marcus shrugged. He didn't seem to be giving in. It was more like he didn't care. I better get home. Carlos stopped short of saying he'd see him out safely, in case he thought he was treating him like a little kid. It was hard to explain why he felt responsible for Marcus, but he did, and now that he'd taken on the job, dropping it after a few hours felt cowardly and wrong. He left first anyway, just to make sure the coast was clear. It wasn't. In the shade of the portico outside, Joshua and Roland Curzon waited, hands thrust into pockets, with one of their bodies. Carlos straightened up and stood his ground. You think you're really hard, don't you, Santiago? Joshua said. He let his arms hang at his sides. Carlos knew what was coming. You're always taking over and telling us what to do. And what are you going to do about it? This, Joshua said, like he'd heard a line in a movie and swung a punch. Carlos was ready for it, but it still hurt, and it was loud. He tasted blood in his mouth right away. The crack of bone on bone made his ears ring. He lashed out automatically, just following his fists, and as he was pummeling Joshua anywhere he could reach, he felt someone behind him. I can't take two of them, can I? Mom's going to kill me if I come home again in a mess. But Roland hadn't jumped him, or the other guy, who didn't seem to be joining in anyway. An unfamiliar hand reached out, grabbed Joshua by the collar, and slammed him sideways onto the ground. It was Marcus. Roland Curzon pitched in to defend his kid brother landing a punch on Marcus just above the eye, and Carlos froze for a split second while he decided whether to go for Roland or pin Joshua down. But he definitely got Marcus Phoenix all wrong. Marcus came back at Roland with a single punch to the face, aimed like he meant it, like a boxer, and Carlos heard his grunt of effort. Roland staggered back. There was an awful silence for a moment before Roland straightened up, blood running from his nose, eyes glazed with tears, and Joshua got to his feet. Their buddy was still rooted to the spot. That wasn't how kids here fought. It just wasn't. Carlos had never seen anyone punch like that, except grown-ups. Marcus looked completely calm, like nothing had happened. But his hand must have hurt. Stay away from me, he said quietly. And stay away from Carlos, or I'll do this again. And it was all over, as fast as it started. The Curzons beat a retreat with their useless body. And Carlos was left staring at Marcus, scared by the way he just punched.
he didn't look strong enough to hit anyone like that. Marcus examined his hand, then felt gingerly above his eye. Is there a mark? he asked. I don't want Dad to start worrying again. Nothing yet, Carlos said, wanting to tell him he was really impressed, but not sure how he'd react. Tell him it was fresh ball. Why would his dad be worried again? Ah, uh, maybe Marcus had been kicked out of school for fighting, and that was why he was taught at home. Why aren't you at a military academy? Your dad could buy the place. He wants me to mix with people. What? Common people? Like me and Dom? I didn't mean it like that. I'm just on my own a lot. You would be in that big house. Did he teach you to punch? It seemed an obvious question. Carlos's dad had taught him how to look after himself, how to form a fist that wouldn't get his fingers broken, how to stay out of trouble unless he had no choice. I mean, that was hard. No, he didn't. Marcus sounded forlorn. Anyway, thank you. Hey, you did okay. You backed me up. That's what real friends do. Marcus had stood up for someone who stood up for him, which Carlos felt was the best thing anyone could do. He wasn't afraid of getting hurt, and he didn't think he was special, or that Carlos was beneath him. Carlos hoped Marcus understood he could rely on him too. Maybe he'd have to tell him that. Marcus came from a different world, and it wasn't going to be easy to work out what he thought about anything. Marcus just blinked a few times, as if the word friend didn't make any sense. Who's Dom? he asked at last. Dominic, my kid brother. He's eight, but he's okay. Must be nice to have a brother. Carlos felt instantly sorry for him. Hey, you can borrow him when you're fed up. Thanks. Maybe Marcus would have forgotten all about it by the morning, or by next week when he'd settled in more. Marcus didn't forget, though. He seemed more at ease when he came into class next day. He had a big bruise over his eye, and he was still quiet. But he acted as if he had a right to be there, and didn't have to apologize for being different. The Curzons heeded a warning and left both of them alone. Nobody ever needed reminding not to mess with Santiago and Phoenix again. Three years later, Carlos Santiago's house. I swear that boy grows up every time I look away. Eva Santiago set the table, pausing a couple of times to look out the window onto the yard. I can't believe he's the same kid. Dom was torn between helping his mother get lunch on the table and hanging out with his dad, Carlos and Marcus, while they dismantled an old engine. Yeah, Marcus had changed a lot in the three years since he'd started hanging out with Carlos. He wasn't skinny anymore. He didn't talk the same way, and there were times when he even laughed. He was actually bigger than Carlos now, as tall as Major Fuller. He was 13, but to Dom he looked like a grown-up already. He likes your cooking, Dom said. You're the best cook in the world. His mother ruffled his hair. What are his folks like? Dom shrugged. Visits to the Phoenix estate, he always thought of it in grand capital letters, weren't like going to a friend's house, and Marcus's parents weren't folks. The place was enormous, full of expensive antique stuff, but it felt like nobody lived there. Carlos made Dom promise not to knock anything over every time they visited. That wasn't often. They're nice. Dom said, but I don't think they know much about Marcus. 
What makes you say that, sweetheart? They don't treat him like you treat us. Mom put on her, I'm not trying to worry you expression. Are they mean to him? No. They just seem like they're trying to work out who he is. And he's different when he's at home. His voice changes, you know, all posh. She started to smile, but it was one of those sad ones Dom didn't quite understand. You're very smart about people, Dom. I think Marcus gets lonely, and I'm proud of you and Carlos for being there for him. Dom lined up the knives and forks, then stood back to admire his handiwork before getting the nod from Mom to go out into the yard. He wasn't just keen to join in the tinkering on the engine. He was curious about the new neighbors who'd moved in two doors away, and whose daughter climbed the trees in their yard faster than anyone he knew. He thought her name was Maria, but he hadn't plucked up the courage to talk to her yet. He was working on it. He kept looking up toward the tree, but there was no sign of her today. Eventually, Mom called everyone in to clean up and eat. She really was a great cook. Marcus always had second helpings and even thirds, probably because it was nothing like the food he had at home, and treated it like a rare delicacy he'd never taste again. Mom seemed delighted that he cleared his plate without fail. Dad was impressed by his capacity for hot sauce. You can eat anything with hot sauce, Dad said, ladling some more rice onto Marcus's plate. When I was a gear, we always made sure we had some in our rations, because food sometimes wasn't so good, you know. Good dose of hot sauce, problem solved. Mom laughed. Ed, you don't need to solve my food, do you? Course not, honey. I just love hot sauce. Would you re-enlist, Mr. Santiago? Marcus asked. You sound like you miss the service. Yeah, I would. Best times, best friends I ever had. Taught me a trade, too. But I've got a good job, and I'm not a kid anymore, so... There was a magic in the army. Dom saw how it lit up his father's face every time. He told great stories about the things his squad got up to, and even when he recalled friends who got killed, and his eyes brimmed, it still sounded like he wouldn't have missed a second of it. It was a world of its own. It all sounded so vivid, like the only place you could truly be alive, even if you didn't know if you'd get killed the next day. You've done your service. Mom didn't approve. It was written all over her face. You don't have to apologize for leaving. The country's got to keep going, and keeping transport running is as important as fighting. Dad smiled, but didn't look as he believed it. You ever thought about the military, Marcus? Dad asked. Marcus paused. I have, sir. Carlos cut in, if he didn't want... Carlos cut in as if he didn't want Marcus to continue. Well, I'm going to enlist as soon as I'm 18. 16 even. You're not dropping out of school early, Mom said firmly. You're staying on until you're 18. You might get drafted anyway if the war gets worse. I don't need to be drafted. Carlos was talking about it all as if it would happen tomorrow. But it was five years away. That was forever. Dom couldn't imagine what five years in the future would even look like. I want to do it. Marcus didn't say anything. But however hard it usually was to work out what he was feeling, it looked pretty clear from the short-lived frown as he busied himself with his fork. Dom didn't feel he could join in the conversation. It was going on over his head, suddenly very grown up and worrying, but one thing was clear. Carlos would join the army, and Dom would be alone. So would Marcus.
That was the look on his face. He had to go to college because his father wanted him to be an engineer. A scientist kind of engineer, not a mechanic like Eduardo Santiago. He and Carlos would be split up, and Dom could see that a realization upset him. The two of them were inseparable. That was the word his mother used. Inseparable. No, we are like brothers. It's worse than that. You don't have to think about any of that for a long time, Dad said. You are still boys. Enjoy being kids while you still can. Changing the subject lifted the mood a little. But now Dom began to see the war not as something that went on in the background without touching his life, but as a real threat to everything that made him happy. He'd be just 16 when Carlos signed up, and Mom had made it clear that she wanted them to finish school. The idea ate at him for the rest of the day. After lunch, they went back into the yard to reassemble the engine. Dom tried to stop thinking about the war and the army, but not even wondering when Maria would show up could put it out of his mind. It took something pretty bad to do that. Mom came out to the back door, looking wide-eyed as if something had shocked her. Marcus, she called. Marcus, sweetheart, come here, will you? Your father needs to talk to you. It's important. Marcus froze. His parents never called here, so this was serious. Was he in trouble over something? No. Marcus never put a foot wrong. He laid down his tools and went into the house to take the call. And Carlos went to follow him, but Mom put her hand on his arm to stop him. Be there for him later, she said quietly. He is going to be upset. I'll stay with him until his father collects him. She beckoned to Dad, and they went into the house. What is it? Dom asked. I don't know. Carlos walked up to the back door, but didn't go beyond the step. He tried to listen, then shook his head. I can't hear anything. It must be really bad, whatever it is. Marcus didn't come out again. A little while later, Dom heard a vehicle pull up at the front, and then Mom and Dad came back into the yard. It's his mother, Mom said. She's missing. His father said she didn't come back from work. Missing like kidnapped? Carlos said. Murdered? Dad shook his head. People go missing for all kinds of reasons, son. They usually show up again. It's probably going to be okay. But let's be really careful what we say to Marcus. It's going to be hard for him until she comes back. Dom followed Carlos's lead and said nothing. His first thought wasn't that she'd been kidnapped, but that she, like Mrs. Garcia in the next street, who walked out because she didn't like her husband anymore. She left her kids behind too. Sometimes mothers did that. Carlos gave up on the engine and went to his room. Dom gave him five minutes and then followed him. When are we going to see Marcus again then? I'll call him later, Carlos said. He looked scared. He's got to go to class, too. What if she's not just run away, and she's dead? Then we'll take care of him, Carlos said. That's what friends do. That's what brothers do. Mrs. Phoenix didn't show up the next day, or the next week. Marcus, being Marcus, turned up for class after a day's absence, and never said a word about it. Carlos waited patiently for him to say something, and made Dom promise not to ask him before he was ready to talk. The three of them sat on the steps of the quadrangle after lunch, textbooks open on their knees, 
Silent. She isn't coming back, Marcus said suddenly. How do you know? Carlos asked. Dad won't tell me where she was supposed to be. What does that mean? said Dom. Marcus stared at his hands. You've seen the movies. If someone goes missing, you retrace their steps. I wanted to know where she was supposed to be, but Dad wouldn't tell me. Why would he do that? Because he must know where she went, and he thinks I'll be more upset if I knew. It was a long explanation by Marcus's standards. So maybe she just left. Maybe something upset her. He didn't have to say he was worried the something was him. Dom could see it on his face. Marcus's relationship with his parents wasn't as easygoing as the Santiago's. But Dom still thought it was weird to think it was his own fault if his mom really had walked out. Dom was about to say that it was probably his father's fault, like with Mrs. Garcia, but Carlos stopped him before he even opened his mouth. I don't think she'd really run away, Marcus, Carlos said. Are the police looking for her? Dad reported her missing, so they must be. Mrs. Phoenix stayed missing, and by Marcus's 14th birthday, four months later, they still hadn't found her. Marcus didn't want to talk about her again. He spent much more time with Dom and Carlos, though, as if he didn't want to go home at all. Mom and Dad let him stay as long as he wanted every day. But Dom heard them talking sometimes in the kitchen late at night about what a rotten shame it was that the boy was so hurt he didn't want to be with his own father. They didn't seem to talk things through, the Phoenix family. But that was okay. Marcus had the Santiago's, and they had plenty enough time and talking for one more brother.